Napoleon Bonaparte is known as a military strategist, a very unlucky monarch, a passionate lover and a person with unique memory. But only a few people remember that it is he who deserves to be called the father of the European Union. 200 years ago, Napoleon united subordinate countries, having introduced common legislation, the notion of a constitution and a management structure all in one. The armies of the majority of European countries were also under the command of France. Moreover, in his many letters, Napoleon constantly mentioned the idea of the introduction of a single currency. But more importantly, Napoleon began to develop what we know today as Western values, human rights, liberalism and so on. At that time, Ukrainian lands were a part of the European Union for a short time. It took that much time for educated people and inquisitive minds of the Ukrainian elite to realize that they were Europeans and did not want to return again to the retrograde state known as the Russian Empire. There is a hypothesis that at that time Napoleon intended to establish a united Europe. But this is nothing but a fallacy, as the majority countries of continental Europe, with the exception of Russia, Austria and Prussia, were simply dependent on him. Napoleon said about himself that in spite of all his victories and defeats, he would go down in history rather as a reformer than a conqueror. He was more of a reformer, offering Europe a conceptually new approach to the legal system. Simply by introducing his version of a constitution and a civil code, Napoleon changed the world outlook of Europeans. The idea of united Europe came from the Roman times. Then, in the Middle Ages, Europe was united into the Holy Roman Empire, and it was abolished by Napoleon Bonaparte. But in its place, he proposed his draft of the new Europe united by the code of Napoleon. It is thanks to the emperor of the revolutionary France that the Roman law is the basis of the current European legal system. The emperor took it as a basis and adapted it to the realities of that time. In the first and the main postulate of Napoleon's code, it was stated that the equality of all people before the law must reign. This law abolished any form of personal dependence and the granting of voting rights to all people led to radical changes in the legal environment of many European countries. So even in a legal context, Napoleon was an antipode to Russian Tsar Alexander I and his retrograde Russian Empire, to which Ukrainian lands belonged at the time. If to consider the Russian Empire, it is quite difficult to say how the Napoleonic Code would have been adapted to the realities of the Russian Empire, as Russian society was not ready for the introduction of such norms. But the European society had been ready for the adaptation and introduction of the Roman law for about a half a century. However, it would be wrong to say that there were many adherents of Napoleon's law in Ukraine. Indeed, Napoleon's ideas were supported by only a few poor representatives of former Cossack officers who did not try to achieve more than the cultural autonomy of Ukrainian lands. The Hetman and Cossack elites were strong adherents of Napoleon's ideas, as they firmly believed that these new norms would lead to the ultimate demise of the empire, an establishment of a constitutional republic and mollification of the social aspect. Ukraine did not switch to the side of Napoleon because there were no Ukrainian leaders capable of this. As a result of liquidation of the Cossack Hetmanate, the Ukrainian elite had two choices – either amalgamate into the Russian Empire or simply fall into decay. Former members of the Cossack nobility who were granted the titles of Russian nobility and received a lot of bonuses, for example serfs, 
exemption from the main taxes, were not ready to lose all of these privileges. They witnessed how the Code of Napoleon operated in neighboring Poland. The Poles abolished serfdom, carried out progressive economic reforms, and introduced and ratified a liberal constitution. That is why the ruling majority in Ukraine actively supported Moscow's position. Having received the titles of nobility, representatives of the former Cossack Starshina, sergeant majors, enjoyed the same benefits as Russian nobility. There were the upper class in the Russian Empire with large land holdings and a vast number of serfs. But Napoleon, who adopted the code in 1804, stood for the abolishment of serfdom. In their turn, representatives of former Cossack Starshina were afraid to lose everything they had. In any case, the Ukrainian elite did not express its clear position in the period of the war of revolutionary France against the Russian Empire. So the historical works reflect only the positions of Ukraine's neighbors, Poles and Russians, who actively played the Ukrainian card. The position of Russia was very simple. Napoleon was an invader, the patriotic war continued, and the one who met the French with peace was a traitor. It is quite difficult to predict how all this would have ended. Had the Cossacks turned to the side of Napoleon, it was quite certain that this could have resulted in internal riots, for example, an uprising of Ottoman troops. At the very least, Russian and Soviet historiographies were composed based on logical and sophisticated positions regarding the Napoleonic period. In order to weaken the Russian Empire, Napoleon planned to take away Ukrainian lands and turn them into a colony of France in order to exploit the vast Ukrainian resources. First of all, these were fodder, horses, oxen for meat, and of course well-trained Ukrainian warriors from among the former Cossacks. The main Russian trade flows went directly through the seaports in Odessa, Mykolaiv, Kherson and Sevastopol. These were export-import operations, so the Russian Empire earned a huge part of the money through Black Sea trading. That is, Ukrainian lands could be a valuable resource for Napoleon's army. That is precisely why the French general staff insisted on a retreat from Moscow through Kiev. But the Russian army quickly cut off this route for Napoleon's troops. Unfortunately, history does not tolerate any conjunctive mood, so there is no sense to think how it would have been if, however, only very few Soviet scholars considered the attitude of Napoleon towards Ukraine. While one of the best Soviet scholars of French history, Yevgeny Tarlay, devoted the majority of his publications to the Great French Revolution and the era of Napoleon, there was no reference to Ukraine. Nevertheless, the theme Napoleon in Ukraine is overloaded with details, and there are dozens of theories as to how Napoleon, Polish patriots, and Tsar Alexander I divided Ukrainian lands. And each of these sides fabricated a lot of stories. There were even a lot of expressions attributed to Napoleon. There are facts in history about the negotiations between Napoleon and the Cossacks. Napoleon himself treated the Cossacks very seriously. In particular, he is known for his phrase «Just give me the regiment of the Cossacks, and I will then conquer all of Europe». That is, he treated them with a certain piety. The Ukrainian classical historical school has also accumulated many myths about Napoleon in Ukraine, and the significance of such a figure as Ilko Borshak, a diaspora publisher and writer 
who considered himself a historian and studied historical archives in Paris, is worthy of mention. But the lack of skills in scholastic, historical and linguistic fields led to making incorrect translations of documents he found. And he added some facts from his own viewpoint. In a number of cases he made a reference to certain documents that in fact never existed. But none of the Ukrainian historians of the Soviet period studied French archives. Therefore, in due course of time, the works of Borshak became authoritative and several phrases even became citations. So the myths and falsified stories invented by this author were published from one monography into other. For example, Borshak was the first to voice the idea that Napoleon planned to attack Russia through the territory of Ukraine. Napoleon's letter to his brother Jerome, the king of Westphalen, is a direct confirmation of the fact that he did not plan to make Ukraine the main direction to attack Russia, and he made a suggestion to prepare a large army in Volyn. This very fact suggests that Napoleon would attack Russia from the territory of Ukraine, but he trusted nobody except his brother, and Napoleon said to him that they would attack Russia in the direction of Brest. In Polish Chronicles it is written that already in 1812 the issue of war against Russia was openly considered at Napoleon's headquarters. There were two plans. The first one was the Northern Plan. It was the plan that Napoleon used as it foresaw a quick military campaign, the siege of Moscow and bargaining. If to speak about the main direction of Napoleon's offensive, then Belarus and the Smolensk region were the main target of the first offensive. The secondary advances were in the southern and northern directions from which he planned to attack St. Petersburg, which at that time was the capital of the Russian Empire. But there was Plan B, the so-called southern one, to allow the Poles to attack the Ukrainian territories, to involve Turkey in order to capture Crimea and the Black Sea Russian regiments, to consolidate a frontline Dvina Dnipro, and only after did he plan to launch his attack against Moscow in full combat readiness. It is one of two plans that the Poles gave preference to because it was well thought out. So, in the summer of 1811, leaders of the Duchy of Warsaw, Yusuf Poniatowski and Michal Sokolnitsky submitted the plan for Napoleon's consideration. Michal Sokolnitsky was a mapmaker and, so to speak, a geopolitician, although this notion was not applied at that time. His main and ultimate goal was to renew the Greater Poland Velkopolska state. So right bank Ukraine had to become a part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Besides that, Sokolnitsky planned to completely Polonize these lands. But this is the special theme for the next program. So always remember that every phenomenon has its own pros and cons, its pro and contra.